Friday, Baylor College of Medicine and Friends of Baylor. Well, uh, last week got a lot of attention. Lily's 10-point plan led to a lot of uh, input from her fans. Actually, uh, one person did mention that in the surveillance piece of it, we should have included wastewater. So thank you for that suggestion, and I'll tell Lily next time to you know get her act together. Also, my sister read a newspaper article in the New York Times said, what's going on with Australia? Why is their mortality so much lower in the United States? So today, Janet, we're going to try and address that issue. So just in, the, in world news about the virus, uh, right now, you know, just I talked about before how, you know, the prospective way of uh, predicting mortality is very good. And what we've done in the many years for flu is look back retrospectively and say, what was the excess mortality? So. The documented cases are really thought to be around 6 million worldwide, but in fact, if you look at excess mortality, the WHO estimates that nearly 15 million people worldwide have died from coronavirus. That's much less than the Spanish flu in 1918, which is more like 50 to 75 million, but it's still way more than any other pandemic. So big impact, obviously, worldwide uh, on mortality. Uh, the European Union is now pretty much uh, removed all face mask, uh, you know, uh, suggestions for people on planes and airports uh, after two years of, of having that mandate. Meanwhile, in contrast to that, China has doubled down uh, uh, in their zero COVID strategy, tightening restrictions in Shanghai and Beijing. Uh, I have no idea why they're doing that. It's going to be impossible to prevent them down the road, but you know, China's China. Taiwan, in contrast, has moved away from that strategy, classic. Uh, another reason for Taiwan to move away from China, but they have, uh, they want to get their economy going, so they're, mo they're mostly relieving uh, all their restrictions. And of course, North Korea had their first case. Uh, the, world, the worldwide map, interesting enough, Australia has a very high incidence, and we're going to talk about that because it's in contrast to their mortality. So this is the incidence map of Australia. And you can see it's, it's really hot. It looks like United States, you know, four months ago. And if you compare Australia to the U.S. in terms of the number of cases per million, look at that. I mean, it is really high and going up versus the United States. You can see us, we're on our uptick. But Australia has really been high. But if you look at mortality, it's like really dramatically different. So this is the United States mortality versus Australia. Now, they are have a slight increase. It's gone up about 2%, but it's way, way lower than the US. So why is that of interest? Well, Australia is about 25 million people. It's about the, a tenth the population in, of the United States. But their death rate, uh, their mortality has been less than one-tenth that of the United States. Uh, and they are at the top of global rankings for protection of life during the COVID pandemic. Uh, they have had a total of 7,800 deaths versus 1 million in the United States. You know, and you could just say, well, they're different countries and different things. But actually, they had very different approach than we did. So they followed very strict guidelines early on in the pandemic uh, to really protect their country. They closed their borders. Uh, they then, uh, when vaccines became available, they rolled them out a lot, very quickly. Uh, and they... They also had one lucky thing. Over time, the virus has become less virulent, and that explains a little bit, I think, why uh, they have done better than the U.S. One thing that they did very differently was they actually trusted in their institutions. Uh, they believed in their government institutions. They followed directions. There wasn't a big politicization of masking. And I think, uh, you know, we, we can learn something from the way Australia uh, handled it. But they did get a little assist from the the luck of the change in virus. So both countries are English speaking, you know, democracies. The median age is the same, 38. Uh, the urban settings about the same, 86% of Australians and 83% of Americans live in urban settings. So what is the difference? What was the difference? Well, early in the pandemic, they restricted travel uh, and all personal interactions until the vaccines were widely available. They maximized uptake in, in high priority uh, people early on. Uh, and they reached a majority of, uh, of, of uh, they made sure that the majority of people were vaccinated before they began to open up the country again. Uh, and I think that that really uh, does play a role because we did not do as good a job around public health. They were also very quick to close their borders uh, to China early on. 
And they had about uh, 241 Australians in China. And remember, remember the chaos when we were trying to bring people back early on? We really didn't quarantine them well. People could just come in. Well, the Australians took everybody who was in China and made sure that they were in quarantine for 14 days before they actually got to be uh, walking around again. So uh, there's no question that they handled it well, and their economy grew faster than the U.S. during the pandemic. So how can we explain this? So uh, this is my uh, diagram from my sister. I hope you can sort of get the idea. But if you look at the virulence of, of the virus, uh, you remember Delta was much more virulent, caused much more death than the Omicron variant. So the, the, it was kind of going up in virulence on the blue line until Omicron hit, and then you could see the virulence begin to drop. In other words, it caused less death. So the U.S. mortality is indicated in the red line. And what you can see is, you know, we had a constant level of mortality until the vaccines were introduced. And vaccines brought that line down. And then when Omicron came, there was a further inflection down. But that difference between the virulence of the virus and vaccines and what we did was about tenfold. And that remains today. We say vaccinations really reduce mortality by about tenfold. Well, what happened with Australia was they had very effective public health measures, so they did not have the same early on mortality that the U.S. did. When vaccines were available, they got a further benefit, and when Omicron became available, even more. But because so few people had been exposed to the virus, even 85 percent vaccinated means 15 percent unvaccinated, there was this huge reservoir of people who could now be infected with the highly infectious, infectious Omicron but it's, Omicron's a lot less virulent. So they, they were lucky, they, that, that happened, they did what was supposed to happen. You, you push, you use public health measures until you get vaccination to protect the population. In this case, they were lucky because the virus that eventually became infectious for them, and you're seeing that big spike in Australia, it's less virulent. In our country, we had a highly virulent uh, virus early on, not as good adoption of public health measures, and so a lot more death early on. And I think that's the main difference uh, between Australia and us. But it's a very interesting and very noticeable comparison <clears throat> that's drawn a lot of um, discussion in the literature. So what's going on in the United States? Well, you know, even though we all think it's great because the numbers are, be you know, down, but they're beginning to go up, there's a real concern because so much of the virus uh, positivity is being tested at home now and not being reported that there's actually a lot more viremia in the community. Cases are rising in almost every state, particularly in the Northwest and Midwest. And, um, you know, we're, I, I think it's, it, it's inevitable we're going to see some rise throughout the summer. Hospitalizations are also going up. They've increased by 20 percent over the last two, two weeks. And unfortunately, we're re reaching almost one million deaths due to coronavirus. It's gotten so bad, the uptick recently in New York City, that they're beginning to talk about recommending masks indoors again. And there's even a consideration that they ma might mandate masks again if hospital census goes up. So that's what's in the news with the virus. If you look at the national figures, you can see there would be a pretty significant uptick that is probably not being reflected as, as high as it should be because a lot of positive cases are at home. We still have only 66% of our country fully vaccinated and much less than that boosted. And so we still have a hugely vulnerable population. And you know, what you can see that's interesting, this speaks to the virulence idea of the virus. While the rate of infections is going up, hospitalizations are not. And again, we're lucky, Australia is lucky too, and that right now, even though Omicron is pretty infectious and still going around and cases are going up, it's not causing a lot of uh, mortality. And ICU admissions aren't going up. So again, the best thing you can do is get vaccinated and boosted. I mean, these are the things that, that protect you. Now, you've, I've shown you these, these di this, this incident map over time. You can see how hot we were in January, how things cooled off pretty dramatically by March 21st. But here we are, you know, just a few months later, and you can see the Northeast is on the increase and the Midwest. And the CDC, which now I think publishes a pretty good map of risk, which is what we really should follow. When people ask me, you know, how should I behave? It's really the risk of the virus in the community. So brown means there's a high risk. Green means there's a low risk. Most of the U.S. is still green, but if you look in the Northeast and parts of the Midwest, the levels of uh, virus in the community are going up, and so those are the communities that you have to be concerned about. Here in Texas, we're, we're still pretty good. 
Our friends at Dimmick County are doing great. <laughs> Please keep it going until the Havelinas get back in town. And then, of course, uh, Harris County is uh, going up a little. And uh, we had a, uh, one of our viewers ask about wastewater. Well, we were, just so you know, we were the first community to do wastewater analysis. It was a collaboration between us, Rice, and um, the city of Houston. And then other communities start doing it. And we've been following wastewater in, you know, for several, uh, almost a year and a half now. But if you look at what's going up in our community, it's about 127% increase versus uh, July 6th of last year. So, you know, that indicates that the viral burden in our community is going up, almost certainly due to Omicron. Now, which variant of Omicron? I heard Peter talking about, uh, Peter Hotez talking about BA2.12. That's true in the Northeast, but that's not true in our community. So this is the, you know, the Omicron variants. You can see it, BA2.12 is the new one coming up. This is BA2 that replaced BA1. BA2.12 is becoming the dominant one in the United States. But if you look at these little buckyballs, the darks, this is a circle representing the total number, total percentage of cases. The dark side is BA2.12, and you can see that in the Northeast in particular, it is becoming the dominant uh, variant. But in the West Coast, it's not. So BA2.2 is still the dominant variant in most of the country, but in the Northeast, BA2.12 uh, is, the, is the variant that is dominating. So what about B4 and B5? We talked about those last week. BA4 uh, is a variant that was detected in January in Limpopo, South Africa. It's now in all South African provinces. provinces. BA5 was detected in KwaZulu-Natal and is also now in all provinces. <clears throat> and in three months, in just a three-month short period of time, BA4 has become 35% of the viral strains in South Africa and, and BA5 is 20%. They're very closely related to BA2, much more closely related to BA2 than the original Omicron. So they're clearly branching off from BA2. BA4 has been detected in Europe, in Austria, the UK, the US in very low amounts. BA5 has been detected in Germany, <coughs> Portugal, the UK, and the US also in low amounts. The concern is that it's growing fairly rapidly and most of the concern is really in Europe. But there's a, there's a real sense that that might become the dominant strain and that it will lead to a, a big summer surge. Uh, there's no evidence, the only good news, that it really produces uh, worse disease. It's no more virulent than the original Omicron. But the reason it's been labeled a variant concern is there is one study out of South Africa that looked at people who were infected with the original Omicron and their ability, their antibodies' the ability to neutralize BA4 and BA5. It turns out it's significantly less. If you've been infected with Omicron and you have antibodies, you, you test them against BA4, BA5, it's much less able to neutralize them. The, the important point is that the antibodies from people who are vaccinated uh, are much more effective than a natural infection. So one more example why vaccination should be done. It's really much more protective against BA4 and BA5, even if you've had Omicron. So no matter what, get vaccinated. And this is a concern people have, well, are there going to be more variants? Well, of course there are going to be more variants. As long as the virus is replicating, there'll be more variants. And here's one of my biggest concerns. This is the vaccination map. And you can see there, almost all of Africa, parts of the Middle East, just have had such low vaccination rates that there's going to be a lot of viral replication. And as long as that's true, these countries will continue to generate uh, a lot of variants. So, you know, we've got to get the world vaccinated. Uh, that's really important. You can't just vaccinate one country and say, oh, we're all fine. Uh, there will always be variants generated elsewhere. So uh, I want to do a couple of shout outs, but before I do, I want to point out that, uh, you know, Congress in its inimical brilliance decided to have a hearing on UFOs. Uh, I looked at some of the, the pictures. I hate to say it, but <clears throat> it was probably, probably Lily flying around I don't know, during the winter games. But, you know, I, I'm afraid to say that, but, you know, what are you going to do? Spent, spent a few million dollars on a hearing of pictures of Lily flying around Tokyo. Uh, anyway, a uh, big shout out this week to Drayton McLean, the Temple Economic Development Corporation and Temple Health and Bioscience District for hosting us this week to share our plans for our regional campus in Temple. We're really, really excited. Our students will be starting there in 2023. Uh, we, also wanna <clears throat> our, we also honored our faculty and celebrated their accomplishments this week. 
And a special thanks to Corby and Barbara Robertson, Norton Rose Fulbright, the Ben and Margaret Love Foundation, the John P. McGovern Foundation, and Sally Clark for their support of these awards. Very important to our faculty. Uh, and finally, giant shout out to Barry Neeland and his wife Ellen, who brought Lily a sweater for President Circle. Uh, Lily wanted to particularly say thank you. She really loves it. Anyway, have a great weekend, and I can't wait to see you next week. Checks, a self-illuminated sphere at least six feet in diameter flew alongside the Omaha for an extended period and was observed through a thermal sensor. Up here, we just had something go right over the top of us. <laughs>